Now they can go buy their ships, buy their, uh, you know, pay their army, and uh, have whatever war they need to have. And the central bank is happy because the most powerful banks in the world, the most connected at that point in England, now we're sure that nobody is going to destabilize their system of fractional reserve banking, where they loan out most of their money and make a interest on it. And at this point, people pretty much had to store their gold with these banks as part of the cartel because they were printing the currency that was used to buy anything in the whole country. So this is the system that we have now. This is a system that spread from England. And you can see why any kind of a state would really favor a system like this. Uh, because whatever financing needs to be, uh, whatever financing a government will need, the central bankers are ready to provide it anytime. Uh, and of course, the state always needs money because the state has no money of their own. How can they make money? They can either tax their citizens, in which case the citizens revolt if the tax is too high, or they can just talk to the central bank and the central bank will buy their bonds or print money. They're not buying these bonds with real money because they don't have any real money. They didn't make any real money. There's no profit there, but they can create it because it's the law. They're the only ones that are allowed to create currency. So how did we get from where we were, from that system where we are right now in the US? And the gold standard is pretty much written into the Constitution. Not pretty much, it is written into the Constitution. Um, and this was a big problem this is for, <laughs> for the government in the US for a long time. It kept the government very weak uh, because they had to finance all their expenditures with real money, with gold. Or they had to tax the citizens. And the citizens don't want to get taxed. The Americans are very individualist. They like to think for, their, for themselves, relatively speaking, to other countries. They were very rebellious people that, you know, because they came from Europe and they were afraid of any kind of, a, um, any kind of uh, authority over them. So there was a few central banks instituted in the United States history. Uh, but their charters ex eventually expired because they were very short term. And the United States, uh, its biggest period of prosperity, where it really became a world power, was after the Civil War, when the United States was on a gold standard the whole time, and it was a constant period of deflation, where there was a gold standard, there was uh, no central bank, and money constantly became more valuable. So if you just hold your gold, you could buy more and more with it over time because there was more goods being produced constantly, production was increasing, technology was getting better and better, more goods are being produced for the same amount of money. And what started happening around uh, the early 1900s was very powerful interests, like the Rockefellers, banking family, and oil family, and the JP Morgans inherently understood, again, the problem that has existed with uh, banking for centuries. And uh, they also needed a way to get rid of this problem. How do we get security, how do we get security in the banking system? So there's no runs on banks, so we can take out more loans, we can leverage, we can leverage more, and we can uh, control the interest rate so it's not as competitive. So you know, everybody can loan out, uh, can loan out at 5%, let's say, and make 5% on this money that they don't really have. And also, at the same time, corporations, of course, Standard Oil, the Rockefeller interests, and other very big, very well-connected corporations always want an easy way to get loans. Um, so they started lobbying the government to institute a central banking system. And you may have heard of this meeting in Jekyll Island where all the press was paid off not to, not to write about it because those people understood the problems and they really wanted to know about any kind of central banking cartelizing going on capitalization going on. So a lot of press was paid off to not talk about uh, this meeting in Jackal Island, Georgia, where these interests, the Warburgs from Europe, which were connected to the banking interests in Europe, uh, J.P. Morgan interests, and the Rockefeller interests, and a few others got together and wrote the Federal Reserve Act together. And they got uh, Woodrow Wilson to institute 
uh, and, and write this into uh, US law or legalize it. Uh, and the way they sold it to the people is there was regional central banks, so to speak. There's, there's the Federal Reserve in New York, there's Kansas City, there's, uh, of course, a few Western ones, there's a Southeastern one. Uh, and the guise is it's a democratic system. There's not one central bank in, banker deciding everything. So what, uh, what happened was there was some backlash, but when Congress was out of session, they instituted this Federal Reserve Act. And of course, what happened uh, soon after was World War I. Uh, something else was also written into law at the same time that the Federal Reserve Act was, um, uh, was uh, written into law. And that's also the income tax. And they could see that, the, uh, that uh, uh, World War I was going to take place. They also understood that they're now going to print a lot of money. And they needed a source of revenue to pay back the loans that they were going to take out from the Federal Reserve. So uh, they knew that they needed an income tax. They needed another source of revenue from the people. And it really started off at a very minimal amount. So then after World War I, we had uh, the Roaring Twenties, if you've sure heard. It's a period of great prosperity in the United States. Well, why did that happen? And you'll, you'll always hear blame on capitalism and greed and, you know, bank and uh, you know, these uh, financial interests, these brokers that are kind of hyping up stocks. What happened was the Federal Reserve had very low interest rates, which encouraged lending. So they lowered interest rates so they could lend more money out, and this encouraged a lot of people take out loans, and it, it added a lot of liquidity to the system. So when you have a lot of liquidity, it inflates the money supply. You have an issue where prices of everything go up, including stocks. So of course, eventually, that system becomes unsustainable, and there's a crash. And that's what happened in 1929. Uh, when this crash took place, You'll hear a lot about Hoover being a very non-interventionist president. Actually, he was the most interventionist president up until that time. And then FDR came in saying that he's not going to be an interventionist president. He's not going to try to stimulate the economy because Americans were very much against that. They understood that it really doesn't work. But what ended up happening is FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which is really, by Americans, is almost deitized. He's almost a deity, he's almost a god at this point. In my opinion, he is absolute worst president of the 20th century. Probably him, Woodrow Wilson, Hoover, uh, a few others. They're all pretty much bad, but there's, there's a few that are decent, halfway. Harding, I would say, is probably the best president of the 20th century. Uh, and why would I say that? Is because Harding was president right after World War I, uh, and uh, there was a threat of a big recession. And actually there was a big depression, not even a recession. GDP dropped by something like 30%. If we had something like that happen at this point, uh, then I don't know what would happen. Everybody would just go crazy probably because they're, they're afraid of, of these kind of numbers. But Harding said, listen, I'm the president. I'm not, I'm not a business person. I'm not going to tell business people how to run their business. I'm not going to print any money. I'm just going to sit here and play some cards. He was famous for having these poker games at, his, at the White House. And you know, that's pretty much all he, all he did. And the economy recovered from this crazy depression in about six months. Why? Because entrepreneurs are smart. And there was no meddling with the economy by bureaucrats who think they know what they're doing. And that's why you never hear about the, the Great Depression of 1920, because Harding knew and understood uh, what was really uh, key to a, to a prosperous economy. And also, the Federal Reserve was very young at that point. So the, at, the, at this point, they, weren't, uh, allow, they didn't have the power and didn't really have uh, kind of the bravery to go out there and stimulate like they do now. So in the 30s, you have FDR. Now also, at the same time, you, you, 
there is this progressive movement and there's more s kind of socialization going on. Of course, you had the revolution uh, of the, where the communists came into power in the Soviet Union and there was a lot of more socialist leaning governments and progressive leaning governments all over Europe at the same time. So this type of a pressure created uh, the type of presidents that we had in the, in the late 20s, early 30s. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt, even though he said he's not going to intervene in the economy, what does he do a few years after he comes into uh, office? He declares a bank holiday so there's no run on banks. And he also, under threat of jail time, prison time, 10 years, he makes everybody take all of their gold and bring it in and, and, uh, to the government and just get currency in return. So he takes the people off the gold standard. So this is the point where the real money is taken away from the people and in return they're just given a paper currency. So you see what's going on there. Uh, he's finding a way to uh, have complete control over the money supply and be able to print as much money as they want without a a it actually being backed by gold. Now, so at this point, the central banking system was still on a gold standard. So countries and central banks in different countries could exchange uh, with each other on gold, but no longer was the U.S. citizen on a gold standard. It was illegal. So then we get to about... Uh, 1944, close to the end of World War I, World War II, sorry. And what we have is the Bretton Woods. Uh, Bretton Woods was an agreement because the United States was the, really the only big industrial power left standing, that the whole world was now going to be on a U.S. dollar standard. So the whole, wor whole world would view as the dollar as their reserve currency. And that's because the U.S. government... Fort Knox and all that really still had most more gold than any other central bank than any any other country, but it was just held it was held away from the people and it was held in certain areas, uh, New York, Federal Reserve of New York, and Fort Knox and a few others. So, other central banks agreed to the system. Now there was a lot of Austrian economists, and Austrian is a, is a certain school of economics that is becoming popular because they really understand what's going on and they predicted all these crises. Uh, they predicted that Bretton Woods would fail. But it, w it went through anyway. Why? Because all the elites, all the elite institutions, all the elite corporate interests and banking interests, they're all on the same side. Uh, and, of course, most, most politicians are as well because that they're financed by these interests. Uh, so Bretton Woods was enacted, and the reason it worked is because the United States promised that any central bank, if they use the dollar as their reserve, could always come back to the United States Federal Reserve and redeem their uh, dollars, their paper dollars, for real gold. 